Good Monday morning. I'm Otis Corbett, and I'm coming to you on Facebook this morning so that we can all start off this week the right way with Scripture and prayer. Our Scriptures for today come from Luke 5 and also Matthew 8 and 14. Let's begin by reading Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now, today we will go sailing. We're going to spend some time in boats today, in small boats at that. As with many subjects, boats can cause people to have some strong emotions. For example, <laughs> a man put a personal ad in the newspaper to try to meet a new girlfriend. The ad said, looking for adventuresome, outdoors-oriented lady with boat and motor. Send photo of boat and motor. <laughs> of course, from the opposite perspective, one wife's definition of a boat is a hole in the water into which you pour money. All joking aside, one emotion that boats can cause is fear. This fear does not come from the boat itself, but from the way sailing is so dominated by the weather. You see, even a minor storm can seem big in a small boat, and even the biggest ships are vulnerable to the overwhelming forces of nature. When the Great Lakes ore carrier Edmund Fitzgerald was launched in 1958, it was the largest ship on the Great Lakes, and it remained so until 1971. She weighed 13,632 tons empty and was 729 feet long. Called Big Fitz, she regularly carried twice her own weight of iron ore to steel mills uh, in the U.S. She was so big and powerful, she seemed to shrug off the forces of nature. That is, until November 1975. On the ninth day of that month, while bound for Detroit, Michigan, with 26,000 tons of iron ore, the Edmund Fitzgerald was overcome by a winter storm and disappeared with the loss of all 29 crew members. If anyone has doubt about the power of nature, they should go to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. At the seafront, they have a pole on which they've marked the height of the storm surge of the many large hurricanes that have come ashore there. You know, I'd always heard about Hurricane Camille, and I was disappointed that the storm surge mark wasn't there for Hurricane Camille, but I was wrong. Up near the very top of the pole, there was a mark that showed a wave height of 30 feet had crashed ashore there. The forces of nature are far beyond we mere mortals, but we'll see today that they don't even compare to the powers of the master of nature. First, we see Jesus as the master of creatures. In our passage from Luke 5, we see Jesus as the master of creatures. No one likes it when people butt into their business. As the old saying goes, those of you who 
think they know it all really irritate those of us who do know it all. <laughs> and the truth is that some people think they know more about a subject than the experts. And just as often, these folks act on their knowledge, and usually when they do, disaster strikes. Now, an example of this is a police department which took upon itself to install a temporary traffic light at an intersection. They had not done the proper consultation with traffic engineers and a fatal traffic accident was the result. They thought they knew more than they did. Now, Jesus should not have known about fishing. He was a trained carpenter and he was a religious teacher. And this kind of fishing was not done just by anyone. These fishermen were highly skilled and trained and had done this for a long time. Catching fish with a net isn't easy. It's actually an industrial process. Yet Jesus did know more about these creatures than these expert fishermen did. You see, Jesus is the master of creatures because he is the creator of all things, as we read in John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Because Jesus is the creator, we need to honor his knowledge. We need to follow his instructions to have dominion over the world and to be good stewards of the world. If we violate his guidance, we risk losing out on his abundance. Jesus was the master of creatures. We need to listen to him about creatures. But Jesus was also the master of storms. Let's continue reading uh, by reading Matthew 8, 23 through uh, 27. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. <laughs> but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? In this passage, we find our expert mariners and our supposedly landlubber carpenter on the Sea of Galilee, which was actually a very large lake. Now, the fact that it was a lake didn't make it any less dangerous. The terrain there is such that a funnel effect is created that causes very strong winds that can create severe storms, like, like the one that sank the Edmund Fitzgerald on another large lake centuries later. Though the dangers were real, the Sea of Galilee was a key element in the economy and culture of northern Israel. Without the sea, there would not have been the same place that Jesus and his disciples ministered in. You see, the Sea of Galilee was a major transportation route, and Jesus and his disciples had sailed upon it to reach the other side, where Jesus had an appointment to meet with the Gadarene demoniac, uh, although the disciples didn't know that just yet. While on the way, a typical storm of great violence descended upon them. The disciples, who knew boats and the lake, were deathly afraid. Jesus, of course, was sleeping. Do you think that Jesus didn't know what was happening? Of course he knew what was happening, but he was not worried because he is the master of storms. When he was awakened, Jesus rebuked the disciples for their fear. He then rebuked the winds and the waves, and calm came over the sea. And the disciples marveled. At the same way, we marvel at a magician, but then being surprised by how simple the solution was after it has been revealed to us. It really wasn't magic at all. It was just sleight of hand. And it was simple. And Jesus, as master of storms, it was simple for him too. Next, we see Jesus as the master of physics. For experienced fishermen, it seemed that the disciples had a tendency to get caught at sea in severe storms. Now, the next time this happened, in Matthew 14, 24-33, we learn that Jesus was the master of physics. 
But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down of out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. And they then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. God created our world, and he designed it to run in certain ways. He created the laws of biology. He created the laws of chemistry. He created the laws of meteorology and of oceanography, and he created the laws of physics. Our belief in an intelligent creator prompted us to systematically study nature, because if there was a design behind the creation, we could discover it and discover how creation works. And these are the roots of modern science. Even though science now seems to despise our faith, in truth, science came out of our faith. God's design was perfect, and it was only marred by human sin. And the laws of physics are largely immutable. They work the same way every time. And we can use them for our own purposes, like flying an airplane, but we can't alter them. Now, when we use the laws of physics properly, we can do wonderful things, like I said, like flying an airplane or sending a rocket to the moon. But when we violate the laws of physics, we pay the price. People often perpetuate the myth that bumblebees violate the laws of of, uh, physics. Well, nothing that can fly can violate the laws of physics. However, if you jump off a building with an open umbrella above you, you will violate them and the results will be painful. Jesus showed us in these verses that he is the master of physics. A man can't walk on water, but Jesus could. And not only could Jesus walk on water, but he could empower Peter to do it as well. Jesus was the master of physics. Finally, we need to see Jesus as the master of our fears. Because human sin has marred God's perfect creation, the world is a dangerous place, and this causes people to experience fear. People are often afraid of four-footed creatures, Uh, you know, like the young lady who, when she was a child, had a puppy dog knock her down uh, and stole her graham cracker, and she was made afraid of dogs by that. Years later, she ran away from a German shepherd that was barking at her, only to fall and hurt herself. People are also afraid of two-footed creatures, like the mother who would always call her daughter when a convict had escaped or if the local police were looking for a fugitive. Jesus, of course, is the master of all creatures, two-footed and four-footed, and we need to let him be our master of our fears about our creatures, about creatures as well. People are often afraid of storms, too. Storms are violent and can cause destruction and death. I know a family whose home was once hit by lightning and almost burned down. It caught fire and almost burned down. They never left the house again fully empty. Someone was always at home just in case lightning might strike the same place twice. But Jesus demonstrated that he's the master of storms, and he needs to be the master of our fear of storms also. People also have uh, what has been called on social media FOMO, or fear of missing out. (laughs) Like children who don't want to nap or to go to bed at night because they're afraid they're going to miss out on something. People sometimes are afraid they're going to miss out on something. We often think that God's way is not the best way. We're going to miss out on something. We try to find ways around the rules of creation. We think we're going to miss out on something. We try to find pleasure in ways that God didn't intend. We think we're going to miss out on something. 
We try to find power in ways that God didn't intend, and we think we're going to miss out on something. We rebel against His plan, and when we do, it costs us because we think we're going to miss out on something. Jesus is the master of creation, and he needs to be our master as well. We need to seek his abundant life, not our faults abundant life. In conclusion, Jesus is the master of nature. He created nature for our blessing. And the way we're most blessed by it is by allowing him to be our master also. Have we done this today, or are we still trying to be our own master? Surrendered him today. He is the master of nature and he should be the master of us too. Now, let's turn our attention to a time of prayer. Let's begin with a few requests from my local ministry uh, situation. Each week we want to pray for a different one of our Covington Baptist Association churches. So uh, this week, please pray for Westview Baptist Church and Pastor Gary Miller. Also, please continue to pray for all of our churches without pastors or who are seeking some sort of staff member. Pastor searches are just very difficult right now, so please pray for our churches who are searching for leadership, particularly our bivocational churches. Pray for our Christian service centers, their compassion ministry that they operate, and also pray for our counselors who touch so many lives with not only professional counseling, but faith-based professional counseling. Pray for our counselors. Now, let's turn our attention to a time of prayer. Let's begin with a few requests from my local ministry uh, situation. Each week, we want to pray for a different one of our Covington Baptist Association churches. So uh, this week, please pray for Westview Baptist Church and Pastor Gary Miller. Also, please continue to pray for all of our churches without pastors or who are seeking some sort of staff member. Pastor searches are just very difficult right now, so please pray for our churches who are searching for leadership, particularly our bivocational churches. Pray for our Christian service centers, their compassion ministry that they operate, and also pray for our counselors who touch so many lives with not only professional counseling, but faith-based professional counseling. Pray for our counselors. On a broader scale, let's continue to pray for peace in places like Ukraine and Syria and Iraq. And pray also for those touched by the recent university revivals. May this have a lasting positive effect on their lives. Pray for those that are going out on mission trips during spring break. Pray that God will keep them safe speed their travels, and give them success in their endeavors for Him. Also, pray that our churches and church members will reinvest themselves in volunteer mission efforts in the post-COVID era. It, it's time to get back on mission. Also, let's pray to prepare ourselves for Easter. Easter should be the Super Bowl of worship for Christians. It's also a prime time when we can do outreach into our communities, and invite people to our churches because people do come to church on Easter Sunday. Now may God give you a good week and may you feel his blessings every day. Let's pray. May God bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Again, I hope you have a great Monday morning and a wonderful week to come. See you again here next week.